She won Most Talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. And you have the most clever book title, Stay Off My Operating Table, which is almost Get Off My Lawn. You know, it's what old people say to the young people, but it's what the physician is saying to anybody of stay off my operating table. What was the impetus for that title? Well, you know, it should be what uh, more physicians are saying to people, but unfortunately, you know, <laughs> they, all too often in yeah. our medical system, we they want to make money. That. Exactly. Well, <laughs> you know, want to make money and don't even realize that it's possible uh, to prevent uh, you know, many of these uh, diseases that are plaguing our society. So, yeah. um, you know, the the title really is just my mantra and my message. You know, I want people to stay off my operating table. I want them to I want to educate them how to do that. And it uh, it just gets the message across and tells people what they need to know. Are you a cardiothoracic surgeon, general surgeon or a little of each? <laughs> And Darren. Okay. I there think I'm goes. back. Okay, Sorry. good. Let's you there a little bit. Okay. Uh, can you, I, I didn't catch that last question. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why this is freezing up. I was asking, are you a cardiothoracic surgeon, surgeon or general surgeon? Yeah. So I am a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. So I operate on the heart and the uh, lungs. Uh, heart surgery is the most common uh, operation that I perform. And I have been practicing uh, cardiothoracic surgery now for uh, over 15 years, really 20 years when you count all the training that went into it. And I think during that time, I've learned a lot about um, what causes heart disease. Uh, but uh, I would say, you know, over the past five years, especially, I have, uh, through my own, you know, health challenges, um, realized that you know, much of what I learned in the early part of my career and during my training um, was incorrect. And I've now come to realize, you know, what truly is at the root cause of heart disease, uh, which is the most common cause of death here in the United States and worldwide. And we need to do a better job of changing that, of reversing heart disease, of preventing people from getting advanced heart disease. So do you think the genesis of that conversation was Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s and 60s? He had a heart attack. He was in the White House. So they told everybody the sky is falling. Quit e I don't know if that's when we started quit eating fat, but that's when our weight troubles really started is when we quit eating fat. What do you think it is? Yeah. So, you know, when you go back and you look at the history of heart disease, um, you know, heart disease was essentially undescribed, uh, you know, prior to about 1900. And, you know, there are reports from prominent physicians, for instance, in the late 1800s, who, you know, spent their entire careers and never saw a, ca a case of heart disease. Wow. And, you know, heart disease started to increase in the 1900s. And, you know, there is some argument about we just learned how to diagnose it. But, uh, you know, that and some of that is true, but it's really not the big part of the story. And through the early 1900s and really, you know, starting to accelerate in the 1940s and the 1950s, heart disease became an epidemic. And then, as you said, President Eisenhower, while he was in office, had a heart attack. This, of course, set off alarm bells and everyone started saying, what what do we need to do about heart disease? And there were two prevailing theories at the time as to the primary causes of heart disease. Well, I should say there were three. Um, you know, first and foremost is the tobacco and the smoking oh, issue. I, I mean, and, women at church were smoking during the, I mean, doctors were telling yeah. people which cigarette to choose. So that had to have something to do with it. Exactly. So, you know, there's that part, which I think is obvious. And, uh, you know, we've largely made an impact on, you know, not that smoking has gone away, but we've been able to greatly reduce uh, the impact of smoking. Um, and then, you know, people started talking about dietary issues, what we were eating. And there were two main theories 
about, you know, what we were eating that may be causing heart disease. One was sugar and the other was fat, specifically saturated fat uh, in the diet. And, um, you know, throughout the 1950s, 60s and uh, really into the 1970s, that was an unsettled uh, debate. Uh, and for various reasons, and we can get into this, you know, the, the fat was chosen as the, you know, the cause of heart disease and that we have to lower our fat and we have to lower our saturated fat intake in particular. And, you know, it was a theory that, uh, you know, had some validity to it, I guess you can say, but it, it was never proven. And to the opposite, you know, we have now been focused on lowering fat, low fat diets, avoiding saturated fat as much as possible uh, for the past 50 to 60 years. And it's not having an impact on heart disease. So it's time for us to step back and say, maybe we chose the wrong path there. Maybe it was the sugar all along. And there's lots of reasons to believe that to be true. And, um, you know, we have to admit that uh, the low fat diet has been a complete failure. And not only in regards to heart disease, but you look at obesity and diabetes, which have skyrocketed during that time that we've been promoting low fat diets. And uh, there's many reasons to think that those that may be related. You know, the reason that we've been getting so obese, the reason that diabetes has become so common is because of our focus on low fat diets. Well, I would, we always say follow the money. So we know that Dr. Kellogg was the man behind the little phrase, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And then the sugar industry uh, backed that type of research. So who is backing research in the 50s and 60s that got that message out? Because that's how we're brainwashed first is through, air quotes, research. Yeah. So, you know, the most uh, prominent uh, proponent of the uh, you know, what's called the diet heart hypothesis. So this is the theory that the amount of fat and specifically the amount of saturated fat we eat in our diet uh, increases our blood cholesterol levels. And then that increased blood cholesterol level uh, is, you know, what leads to heart disease. And the primary scientist behind that was uh, Ansel Keys. Oh, and, um, okay. you know, <laughs> we, we now know that uh, much of what he built his platform upon was um, either very poorly done science or outright fraudulent, fraudulent science. Um, you know, for instance, his, uh, you know, seminal study, um, which supposedly established the relationship between saturated fat consumption and heart disease on the population level, um, the six country studies, um, where he demonstrated that in these six countries, you know, there was a linear relationship between the amount of saturated fat that was consumed and the incidence of heart disease. Um, but what he didn't include in those in that, you know, study was that he actually looked at 22 countries and he handpicked the six that lined up. But you had countries like France, for instance, which at the time had the highest consumption of saturated fat and the lowest incidence of heart disease. Right. Uh, but he just ignored that and uh, kind of cherry picked his data. And that is, you know, really what got the whole theory going. And then, you know, he was uh, both um, influential and uh, also, you know, a very powerful personality. So everyone He's, who challenged yeah. this theory, um, you know, he would attack personally. Uh, so uh, there was another physician at the time, uh, Dr. Yudkin, who was a proponent of the sugar uh, theory of heart disease, basically. And, you know, Ansel Keys uh, was merciless in attacking Yudkin and, you know, went after him and got all his funding pulled and, you know, called him a quack and all of these things. And, and you know, we set down this path. And again, you know, at the time, we didn't know which theory was correct. So we made a choice. Um, and, you know, you can argue about that. There was certainly some nefarious things that went on in the industry and all that. But, you know, we made a choice. And now here we are 50 years later, and that choice has clearly not worked out like we expected it to. So now it is time that, you know, we need to step back. This should have happened a long time ago, but we need to step back and say, 
we need to take a different approach. I'll go ahead and say that Ansel Keys was the uh, Anthony Fauci of his day. Any way you want to look at that, because Anthony Fauci is powerful. He has messages that are very controversial, and we won't know the effects of what Anthony Fauci proposed until 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Just you heard it here on Lisa Fisher Said Podcast. You'll be in your rocking chair at the nursing home someday and go, you know what? That lady talked a lot, but she was right about one thing. I'm just saying it now. So this is the other thing about Ansel Keys, those of us in the intermittent fasting community, we know him, of course, for the Minnesota starvation experiment that had uh, conscientious conscientious objectors from World War II. And that was some crazy stuff. That was almost abusive, what he did. I mean, it was abusive. It it was, there were human rights violations to these people. But, and it also, to me, had some erroneous, his studies, or maybe they were, there was some fact involved in it, but. There also, I felt like some of that may have been falsified. I don't know, because I wasn't there. Well, but Yeah, we know, for instance, that, you know, uh, his studies that didn't end up showing what he expected them to show, he just wouldn't publish them, you know. So, the uh, uh, yeah. you know, the Minnesota coronary experiment is the uh, famous example of that, um, where they took, um, these were patients who were institutionalized, um, you know, in uh, psychiatric facilities. And the event, it was actually a very, you know, kind of brilliantly designed and well done experiment because they were able to control everything these people were eating. And they were able to uh, design a diet, you know, the standard diet that was high in saturated fat, and then the intervention diet, which substituted vegetable and seed oils, polyunsaturated fats for saturated fats. And, you know, very well done, very tightly controlled population. And in the end, it showed that the people who got the intervention diet, lowered their saturated fat intake, had a higher incidence of mortality. They died more often. There was no noticeable impact on the uh, heart disease. Um, Their cholesterol levels came down. Um, So it basically disproved the diet heart hypothesis and Ansel Keys and his team just never published the data. And it was only, you know, many years later that this data was uncovered and uh, published. And by that time, Ansel Keys had passed away. um, But, you know, one of his um, co-authors, one of his co-investigators was still alive. And they said, you know, why, why didn't you publish this data? And he said, because, you know, it didn't agree with what we were trying to God. show. That's criminal activity, actually. I mean, because of the lives, the people's lives are at stake in that situation. It makes us all guinea pigs. So why isn't the diet heart hypothesis, the one that you're explaining to us, that saturated fat is fine, why isn't that required reading for everyone in American or Western medical institutions. Why why aren't we pushing that at heart hospitals? Yeah, again, because it just goes against the narrative, you know, so it's interesting. Um, When you look at the dietary guidelines, uh, when you look at the American Heart Association recommendations, um, both of those organizations have actually uh, taken out of the recommendations limitations on saturated fat. Um, but they didn't really publicize that, you know, they kind of bury it in the reports, you know, there were quotes in there, you know, to the effect of saturated fat is no longer a nutrient of concern. Um, you know, there've been many, you know, many, many meta-analyses done, uh, at this point, you know, studies of the studies, and they all come to the same conclusion that you cannot, you know, reliably associated, associate saturated fat dietary intake with heart disease. Um, Yet, you know, the narrative has been all all around us for 30 or 40 years, you know, realize that doctors today, uh, you know, the doctors that are my age, and, you know, older, um, have heard this their entire career, you know, I never heard anything different during my medical training. Um, You know, you have to find doctors who were basically trained in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, So these are now people who are, you know, in their 80s and 90s, for the most part, no longer practicing medicine to find a doctor that ever heard anything different than, you know, the diet heart hypothesis. So, 
um, you know, and, and they are in the same society. They've heard the same dietary guidelines and the food pyramid and everything their entire lives. Uh, you know, while they were growing up, this was, you know, the information that was out there. I mean, I certainly remember, you know, growing up, everything was low fat. We drank skim milk. We had margarine Wasn't instead it of awful? butter. It was terrible. Yep. Yeah, but that's what, you know, that and again, it took me a long time uh, on a personal level to overcome that. You know, I found myself morbidly obese, pre-diabetic and headed down a pathway that I was going to end up on my own operating table, so to speak. And I was following all those guidelines that I had learned in school, that I had learned as a child, and it wasn't serving me. And it took a You know, it it took a lot for me to finally say, you know, this must be wrong and be open to, you know, new information, different information. And ultimately, I saw the positive effects that that had on my health. And I came to realize, you know, that this is the information that I should be uh, educating my patients on. Well, when were the blinders lifted and how what was the process for you? Well, you know, it um, for me, it really uh, started um, when I heard Gary Taubes deliver a talk yeah. um, at a medical conference, um, and he had just written the case against sugar, and of course, before that, had written, you know, why we get fat and what, good calories, what was bad that? calories. Was that fifteen years ago? <clears throat> Twenty years ago? No, that was uh, about seven years ago now. Oh, so it's that only been that long. Oh, I thought yeah. he's been around. He's a science writer. I mean, that yeah, he's a science yeah, writer. Prolific um, things. But I thought yeah. he'd been around longer. But maybe I just I've known his name for so long. Yeah. And he had actually written before, you know, those things uh, before he got focused on nutrition. Um, his focus as a journalist was on bad science yeah. in general. Yeah, and, you know, it. how we, how we get some of these things wrong. Uh, cause again, science is science, you know, we, we, that's why things are hypothesized. They are theorized and then they get proven or disproven with the, with the science. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, so Gary's background, you know, goes into that and then he turned, you know, towards nutrition in the diet industry and, uh, ultimately, you know, exposed a lot of what we've gotten wrong in that area. So I, you know, just by chance, um, heard him deliver a lecture. And as I said, at the time, I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And wow. I had tried all of these things that we've all been told, you know, over and over again, counting my calories and eating the low-fat diet and, you know, moving more, eating less, all of this stuff. And, you know, it didn't work for me, just like I was seeing it not work for my patients. Uh, and thankfully, I was exposed to this new information. I was open to, you know, hearing it and looking into it. And and I tried it for my first, for myself first, and it worked. And then I, you know, friends and family said, what are you doing? And I said, this is what I'm doing. And they tried it and, you know, they had great success. Um, And then it took, you know, quite a while for me to be uh, confident enough and brave enough yeah. to start talking to patients about it because again it goes very much against the the mainstream narrative. So what was the first thing you did? Was it eliminating sugar, grains, carbs? Yeah, so for me it was uh you know, I went gluten-free first which, you know, kind of unintentionally yeah. uh it lowered carb intake severely because they didn't have a lot of the substitute products uh, back then. Uh, And then uh, I eliminated sugar completely. And from there, it really became more of a, you know, progressively lower carb, but also focused on elimination of processed food in general, and uh, really got to a point of just eating whole real food. And then uh, for the past, uh, you know, four years now, eating a primarily carnivore diet. Uh, the carnivore diet has surprised me so much in my satiety levels because I have been intermittent fasting for five years and I just started intermittent fasting just to, reluse, to reduce the amount of, you know, my insulin, you know, to become more insulin sensitive. But I still snacked during that time. And now as um, eating 80 or 90 percent, 85 percent carnivore, let's say, I have so much satiety. And that to me has been so surprising. So there are no snacks. I don't need snacks. And a lot of 
intermittent fasters do one meal a day or two you know it just depends what your life is so did you notice a difference a shift because i tried keto and i don't know uh, and i as a health coach i have a lot of women who will say it just doesn't work well with me so i didn't know if it was a hormonal thing with women but i even though my carb load now is pretty i mean really low like really low not because i'm reducing carbs i'm increasing meat so but some, mm-hmm. there's kind of a switch in there. Do you see a difference between the two eating plans or styles? Yeah, so I think there is. You know, uh, my personal experience, you know, I was exceedingly low-carb keto. I mean, I was probably under 20 grams of carbs a day. Uh, wow. And then I heard about carnivore, and I said, oh, let me let me give this a try. Uh, at first, I said, oh, well, that sounds kind of crazy. And then I said, well, let me give it a try. You know, this is a good three years into my kind of low carb experience. Um, the two things that I noticed about carnivore, first of all, was I still had some residual inflammation um, on the low carb keto, on the keto diet. Um, for me, it was plantar fasciitis, my right wow. foot uh, for years. You know, I'd get out of bed in the morning and my right foot would hurt for, yep. you know, 15, 20 minutes until I kind of hobbled around and stretched it out. And I could not get rid of that. I had done all the physical therapy. I had stopped running. I, you know, everything, right. changed shoes, all that stuff. Uh, my third day on carnivore, um, I got out of bed. I put my foot down. It didn't hurt and it didn't come back again. Wow. And early on, you know, if I would kind of stray from carnivore and have, a, you know, still, you know, keto, but, you know, uh, not not uh, carnivore, um, I would start to feel it in my foot. Uh, so that was the first thing for me. And then the second thing, the reason that I've really stuck with it um, is the simplicity and the satiety. Like you said, I mean, I, I typically eat once, you know, I'm typically a one meal a day, sometimes two. Um, but I'm just not hungry. And if for whatever reason, you know, there are times that I have to go, you know, longer, um, you know, I can, and it's not a problem. Uh, you know, so if I'm in the operating room for long periods of time, I'm not getting hungry. If, uh, I'm traveling and there just isn't, you know, just isn't good food available, then I just don't eat. And, you know, that's not an issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's the satiety is powerful and then the simplicity, you know, it's, a, you don't have to count anything. You don't have to track anything. It's just, you know, eat, uh, animal products and move on with your life. It's steak and eggs. I mean, it's steak and yep. eggs. It's burger and eggs, steak and eggs all the time. A friend of yep. mine, I just before started the interview, I was, I, I said, I got to go. I've got to interview this important man. She goes, well, what do my kids eat on carnivore? And so I just said, steak and eggs and beef and eggs. So, but that is a good question. It's easy for me to be, to look at my plate and know that a ribeye or a New York strip or sirloin, you know, is delicious and all the things and having local farm fresh eggs. But how do we get our kids to switch over to eating that way is it easy for them do they have satiety levels that increase too i think they do you know um obviously you have to overcome the uh what's all around them um yeah. which is a problem i mean they go to school and they get served uh you know uh what i think is pretty horrible food at most schools yeah, and crap. of course they see you know their friends and they go to the birthday you know we've built our whole society around this you know processed uh, garbage, uh, that we call food and we've normalized it and, you know, no one wants to take a step back, but they've, they've actually done interesting studies where, you know, with babies, um, you know, if you present them with different food options, uh, they will gravitate towards the more nutritional, you know, uh, real food, uh, because this is an instinctual thing. That's interesting. All animals and, you know, humans included, um, our bodies know what we need and we're always looking for it and it's nutrients. Um, And the problem with all this processed food is it's really devoid of nutrients. You know, they try and add some stuff back in, but our bodies can't absorb them well. They're not the real thing. And so this is why we're always hungry when we're eating processed food, because we're putting in lots of food. Um, but we're not putting in the proper nutrients. And when you eat real food, um, primarily animal products, you're giving your body the nutrients that it needs. 
And now you're not hungry because, you know, you're giving your body what it needs and, and uh, you're not as hungry as often. So, you know, that certainly applies to both children and adults. Uh, the problem with children is just, you know, everything else that's around them. Uh, but, you know, I can tell you, we, we don't, you know, force carnivore or anything on our children. Uh, but when we're at home and, you know, we've made a, you know, a low carb, you know, mostly carnivore meal because uh, my wife, you know, is also very low carb. Uh, they they eat the uh, you know, they eat the meat. And, uh, you know, we can all think back to our childhood about how our parents always used to have that fight with us to eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables <laughs> yes. all the time. They were um, saying, and, eat your steak. <laughs> right. Yeah. No one, no one had to force me to eat the <laughs> steak. Right. You know, they would force me to eat the vegetables. And it's like, well, maybe, you know, maybe I knew back then. Yeah. That's that's a, a great visual, I think, for everybody. Uh, let's go back to your plantar fasciitis. Do you think there's something, because, you know, Paul Saladino in his book, The Carnivore Code, talks about that um, plants don't want to be eaten and they're the anti-nutrients that cause inflammation. Do you think there was just something, even though it could have been a green bean or a nightshade that was providing inflammation that made it that you couldn't hop, hop out of bed? Yeah, I think, you know, there certainly was something that I was still eating and whether it was uh, the plants in particular or maybe it was, you know, um, I wasn't as uh, cognizant at that time about the whole vegetable and seed oil. So, yeah. you know, some of the keto products that you eat, you know, that has some of that stuff in it. Um, and, uh, you know, so they were certainly something that was still triggering inflammation. And that's how it, you know, manifested for me. And, you know, I see people, I see patients all the time now that have different manifestations of these things. You know, some people it's, you know, the gut problem, some people it's thyroid problems, some people it's joint problems. Yeah. Uh, but in the end, um, you know, the carnivore diet, if nothing else, is just a great elimination diet. It's the best elimination diet. It's, you know, kind of the minimal uh, that that humans can survive on. And so I'll often use it as that. And, you know, some people end up sticking with it long term. Some people don't. They don't necessarily need to. You know, I don't think that everyone needs to be 100 percent carnivore, uh, but I think a animal based diet that's focused on whole real food, prioritizing protein, um, you know, that is the healthy sort of construct that everyone should then figure out, you know, what works best for them. Maybe it is sort of more of a keto diet. Maybe it's more of a carnivore diet. Um, you know, these things that people talk about, you know, introducing this or that, I say, OK, try it, you know, but at least with the carnivore diet, you know how good you can feel. You eliminate, mm -hmm. you know, most of these problems and, and most people feel their best. And then if you want to start reintroducing things and seeing but paying attention to, do you still feel that good? And if the answer is no, then the then that probably means that's something that you shouldn't be eating. Uh, when you went from how much did you lose on keto? So, you know, overall, I lost about 100 pounds. But was that uh, both during, di both keto and then carnivore? It, it was actually primarily the keto part wow, of it. You know, honestly, since, since I went carnivore, I haven't really lost any additional weight. I've had a good shift in body composition. Mm -hmm. I've added a lot more muscle mm -hmm. um, and, you know, lost some more fat during that journey. Uh, but my overall weight, you know, has been roughly the same uh, for the, the three or four years that I've been carnivore now. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's important to note. I think that I haven't regained the weight oh, because I, yeah, in absolutely. the past, you know, um, I would lose some weight when I would do some of these short term, you know, count my calories and, and, you know, the eat less, move more thing. And I would be able to lose weight in the short term, but I would always gain it back usually more. Um, and now, you know, here I am, seven years into this and i haven't gained the weight back um i've been able to stay stable like i said i've had positive you know changes in my body composition uh with carnivore uh but i really you know it, it's not that i've lost more weight on carnivore i really lost most of the weight you know with the keto low carb before going carnivore 
Right. You can't go wrong with it. Uh, Dr. Fung breaks down uh, the hunger and satiety hormones, and it's the, I'm very visual, so I can understand that better. We know ghrelin because it's the one that knocks on our, you know, it's time to eat the stomach ghrelin. But as we know, hunger is not an emergency. You can go on. But he says that you won't get true satiety until, I mean, we know about leptin. People can be leptin resistant, but he said until you release cholecystokinin and YY peptide, I think I get those right. That's, he said, those are not released in the hippocampus, right? Or the hypothalamus. Is that where, is that kind of the endocrines? Um, yeah, the hypothalamus. Yeah, yeah, hypothalamus. He said, that's where we'll see those are released after you've had protein and fat. And so vegetables are a high carb diet. I mean, you know, if you look at it that way, they 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 are predominantly carbohydrates. So that's why I think I've understood. That's why I feel like I'm understanding my body more. And again, I've been fasting for almost five years, but it was this summer. This is 2022. We're recording this that I kind of switched over more to carnivore and I'm having more satiety. And I think it's because my hunger hormones are really saying you're done. You're full. You don't need any more because I'm I'm getting the ones that are communicating that are putting me in balance. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? Yeah, like I said, I think ultimately, you know, animal products, uh, meat uh, is the most nutrient dense food that we have available to us. And th those nutrients are able to be absorbed and utilized by our bodies. Um, the, this is the food that we evolved eating as humans. So this is the food that our digestive system and, and all the, you know, hormonal uh, uh, pathways that, you know, are part of that have evolved uh, based on. Um, and when we start introducing these other things, you know, these processed foods, uh, that is really what starts to hijack and screw up uh, those uh, systems. So I think ultimately, you know, uh, Dr. Fung, Jason is a much smarter guy than I am. Um, he gets into all of those uh, things. Yeah, he does, I yeah. really try and, you know, keep it at a basic level for people. And, uh, you know, ultimately what I tell my patients is, listen, I don't know what the right diet is for you. We have to try these things. Um, but I do know that this is the framework that works for most people. And it starts with eat whole real food. Um, and if you do nothing else, you know, if you just eliminate processed food, um, and, you know, honestly, this is, you know, what a plant based diet is, hopefully, um, and what a carnivore diet is. And they both work. You know, they both people get improvement from both. Uh, now, the problem that you get into with the plant based diets long term is that there are essential nutrients that we can't get from plants. And that's just a hard stop. You know, it just is what it is. So. If you're going to do a, a completely plant-based diet over the long term, you have to figure out some way to make up for those deficiencies. Supplements may or may not do a good enough job of that over the long term. And that's why I think we see a lot of people who, after long term on plant-based, aren't doing as well as they were initially. Um, you know, plant-based is clearly an improvement over standard American diet. Right, um, right. And I always... Uh, qualify that by saying if you're not eating processed plant foods, which there are plenty of processed plant-based foods these days. That's, that's uh, so right. if you eliminate that and you do a, a whole real food plant-based diet, you're going to get improvements. And whether or not you can maintain that long term, you know, starts to get, um, it just gets more complicated than uh, the carnivore diet where, you know, we can get all the nutrients we need from eating meat and we can you know, that's how we survive for most of our existence as human beings. I think another interesting component to carnivore is um, <laughs> the improvement in gut health without eating. Now, you can eat fermented vegetables. I mean, some people choose to eat fermented vegetables. But Dr. Saladino even had the research that showed that our gut health does improve because of what animal protein, the, what's in animal protein that benefits our gut health. Maybe it's because... I'm eating grass-fed beef that's close to my home and it helps a microbiome. What, what's the thinking with that? How does that work so magically? Yeah, again, I think, it, you know, you have to look at both aspects of it. You have to look at what are you eliminating and then, you know, what 
unique things are these foods uh, bringing to you? And, you know, I still go back to the elimination of the processed food yeah. being the most important step, because, you know, when we stop damaging our bodies, our bodies have the capacity to heal. And, you know, I see this in all forms, you know, whether you're talking about gut health or you're talking about heart health uh, or lots of other things that we can look at. You know, the first step is just stop doing the constant damage to our bodies that we are doing by eating these processed foods. Um, for some people in particular, you know, they clearly have sensitivities to some of these things in plants. And so for those people, you know, plants need to be eliminated. Maybe that is long term. Maybe it's just short term. For a lot of people, it's just give the gut a chance to heal. And once it heals, now you're not as sensitive to these things anymore because, you know, you're, you're, you haven't, uh, you know, you don't have that impaired barrier, uh, that's allowing these proteins and things to get across that they're not supposed to. Um, so, uh, but ultimately I always start with eat whole real food and then, you know, see from there, um, which way the pathways lead you, what you feel best on, um, what works in your lifestyle, what's available to you, you know, um, I love, you know, like you said, you know, the more you can do it locally, mm -hmm. the better, um, you know, both for your health and just for the kind of overall system. Um, you know, if you can do it locally, great. Uh, but everyone needs to figure out what's going to work in their lifestyle, um, and what's going to best support their health. The one thing, it was about 10 years ago, because I've been a home cook all these years and would hear, you know, certain people. That's I hadn't turned the TV news on since, or the TV on since March 10th, 2020. So I don't know what's being told now. But before that, we were told to cook, those of us who cook, with sunflower oil, um, canola oil, heart healthy. It said heart healthy canola yep. oil. Well, yep. that's a, heart that is a lie approved. from the pits of hell. So how can we reverse that? How can we get the truth out the doubt? And we sound crazy saying they're wrong. Yeah, again, you know, I just point to the evidence that's all around us. Um, you know, these things uh, are a recent introduction into our environment, into our food supply. Our bodies were not evolved uh, to um, process them uh, and, you know, since we have had these and since we have been, you know, pushing them more and more uh, into our food supply, our health has only worsened. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just step back and say, look at the, you know, look at the evidence that's all around us. Um, are these things essential to life? Clearly not. Um, are they having any benefit? Clearly not. So why would you want to continue eating them? Um, you know, and, uh, you know, it just comes down to, again, each one of us as individuals needs to make these decisions. You know, we have the power within ourselves to start changing. You know, the government can't force, you know, isn't there force feeding us? Um, they can have their recommendations, yeah. but that doesn't mean you need to follow them. Um, and the same thing goes for, you know, uh, Really, when you're dealing with your physicians, you know, your physicians shouldn't be forcing things upon you. Right. Your physicians should be guiding you, should be educating you. Um, but uh, if your doctor is telling you, you know, uh, you know, that I, I can't be your doctor because you eat a carnivore diet, then the answer is get a new doctor because that's a lousy right. doctor. And if your doctor says, well, if you don't take this medication, I can't be your doctor, then again, um, you know, might be time to find a new doctor because that is not what physicians should be. Um, that is not how physicians should, uh, you know, treat our patients. I mean, when I look at my, um, you know, the heart surgery part of my practice, um, there are oftentimes situations where it is clear that a patient will benefit from heart surgery. And, you know, 100 out of 100 doctors would agree on that. Um, but if the patient says, I don't want heart surgery, you know, I'm not there to force them to have heart surgery. I'm going to say, OK, let's figure out, you know, what's the best thing we can do, uh, you know, that you want. Uh, and for whatever reason, they may not want, you know, heart surgery in that situation. And my role as a physician is to work with them to figure out what the best option is.
But now the surgeon isn't the one who would ever prescribe the statin, right? That would be the cardiologist. Well, so, you know, again, the guidelines are uh, after heart surgery, you know, that everyone should be on statin medications. Um, you know, I didn't I don't, realize that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, anyone with heart disease. Now, again, these are the guidelines. We can argue about their merit and whether or not they're uh, correct. Um, I would say that. It, it, so what I step back again and say is there is no medical treatment that is right for everyone. You know, it's just not how medicine works. Um, we don't have perfect treatments uh, on either side of the equation, whatever you want to look at. So, um, you know, I think all of these decisions should be individualized um, and the conversation should be had, you know, with the patients. Um, you know, when you look specifically at statins, um, the best benefit of them is in people with heart disease. Um, it's still not a huge benefit. And, you know, I, I still think that there are situations that people with established heart disease may not be well served by taking statins, um, but that should be a very individualized yeah. discussion. And um, your physician should be able to have that discussion with you. You know, if you ask your physician, why are you prescribing this medication for me? And their only answer is, that's what the guidelines say, mm -hmm. again, Maybe it's time to find a new physician because um, guidelines shouldn't uh, prevent doctors from thinking for themselves and shouldn't prevent individualized uh, decision making between physicians and patients. So is the definition that anyone who's had a cardiac event is then prescribed statins or has heart disease? Do they have heart disease then? Um, yeah, certainly anyone okay. who's, you know. Uh, had heart surgery. That's one of the uh, defining events of of having heart disease uh, of some form. Now, uh, there are nuances, you know, understand that, you know, there are certain types of heart surgery that don't have to do with cholesterol right. or statins or blockages in the arteries. That's kind of a whole different discussion. Uh, but in general, you know, when most people think of heart disease, they're commonly thinking of what we call atherosclerotic heart disease or coronary artery disease blockages that build up in the arteries. And anyone who has had coronary artery bypass surgery, which is the most common operation we do uh, for people with that type of problem, um, the recommendation is that they should be on a statin after surgery. So is um, all blockage, is it sometimes, can you have average cholesterol and still have a blockage or can you have, a, can you have high cholesterol and no blockage? Yes, both both okay. cases uh, are are quite common. So you know it is not unusual at all. Um, about half of the patients that I end up doing surgery on have a cholesterol level that is you know within what's considered normal. Uh, okay. Many of those patients, because they're taking medications to lower their cholesterol, some of the patients just naturally have lower cholesterol levels, and they still end up with heart disease. And on the flip side of things. Um, there are many people walking around with high cholesterol levels that have absolutely no evidence of heart disease. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, both of those facts tell me that cholesterol isn't the complete picture. And that's ultimately, you know, again, what I talk to my patients about, that this decision should not be based on one number. Our bodies are much more complex than that. We cannot reduce these decisions down to one number and just say categorically, if this number is above X, you need to do this. Um, and so that's where the, um, you know, uh, individualized decision making should come into play. Well, I would like to know your um, lipid panel profile going from an obese doctor who probably I mean, you was looking at maybe had lower saturated fat to the person who's lost 100 pounds, who is metabolically fit, who doesn't have any, you know, risk of metabolic disease, I would assume, you know, you're not in the 88 percent of the people that we talk about. And then maybe yeah. your cholesterol has ooched up. Has it done that for you? Yeah, so it has. So, you know, my um, at, at sort of the beginning of my uh, journey, you know, my uh, LDL cholesterol, my so-called bad cholesterol was you know, a little bit elevated. It was 130s. 
Um, my uh, triglycerides were very elevated, okay. uh, you know, uh, 200 range. And my HDL cholesterol, you know, was on the lowish side, like in the 30s. Not horrible, but lowish. Um, when I lost a lot of weight, uh, my LDL cholesterol went up significantly. I think the highest one I had was about 350 um, for my LDL cholesterol. Uh, all of my cardiologist buddies, they were having heart attacks looking at my uh, panel. Um, but my triglyceride level came down and my HDL level went up. And um, after some time, those numbers settled down some. So my LDL cholesterol now, you know, depending on when I check it, runs somewhere typically around 200, you know, to 250, still pretty elevated. Um, my triglycerides run between 50 and 70, and my HDL tends to hang around 50. Um, I have now had two coronary artery calcium scans, three years apart, both zero. Okay. Um, I'm, I just turned uh, 48, uh, so I had my first scan, I was about 44. Okay. My second scan, you know, a few months ago, I was 47. And despite my cholesterol being high, my LDL cholesterol being high that time, um, my uh, CAC score has remained zero. So now, I think more important numbers to be paying attention to are, you know, the fact that my insulin level uh, came down from, you know, 20 something to, you know, it's typically around four or five. Your fasting insulin was 20 my, something at one time? Uh, the highest. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that I checked it at was uh, around uh, 20. Wow. My uh, hemoglobin A1C came down from, you know, 5.7 to, uh, you know, 5.4 or so, uh, 5.3. Um, you know, so these are more important numbers that I look at. I, I do, you know, the advanced lipid panels, uh, yeah. both for myself I and my patients. <laughs> um, um, pattern A, yeah. uh, you know, my LP little A number is, is low. Um, but my ApoB number, which everyone, you know, harps on is high, you know, along with my LDL, you know, C, they kind of oftentimes track together. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I look at my CAC score and it's zero. And so, um, you know, I uh, don't see any reason to lower, to make intentional efforts to lower my LDL cholesterol, whether that be diet-based interventions or medication-based interventions. And again, that doesn't mean that that holds true for everyone. Um, these are individualized discussions. You know, there yeah. are some people that, you know, need to be addressing their elevated LDL cholesterol. Um, my problem with the, uh, you know, standard messaging around that is that it's only focused on lowering your LDL cholesterol. So these people who clearly have, you know, the metabolic syndrome and they have an L elevated LDL cholesterol and they get told, take your statin, lower your LDL cholesterol and you'll be fine. And that's clearly not the case because they still end up, you know, on my, on my operating table. Uh, so we need to do a better job of looking at the whole picture and looking at the true root causes of heart disease. And again, we know that insulin resistance is a much bigger risk factor for heart disease than an elevated LDL cholesterol. It's consistently shown in every study. Of disease? Yes, I mean, we of, don't do, of diseases yeah. across the board, cancer, dementia. It's, yeah, oh yeah, no, and that's exactly it. Insulin resistance plays a part in a lot more than just heart disease. Um, and yet, you know, most, People, when they go to their physician, their physician doesn't even mention insulin resistance, uh, may not even know how to diagnose it, uh, and uh, certainly, you know, does, doesn't spend their time focused on the treatment of it. You have to kick them in the ovaries to get them to test it, and they'll still tell you, well, we can, or you're fine, or your A1C is fine. And I, as a health coach, I'm like, bring me that number. C-reactive protein is something else I thought was in kind of that mix of those of us who have high cholesterol for us. And my healthcare provider does not sound the alarm. She's not worried because she, my fasting insulin is 1.1. You know, it's really low. But is C-reactive protein something else you look at under the, with those numbers? Yeah. So inflammation, you know, is clearly uh, part of this process as well and part of the process that leads to heart disease. So C-reactive protein is a uh, pretty good measure of that. 
And I think it is an important uh, metric to be tracking. Yeah, that I wish more people looked at. Now let's talk about what you're offering because I love your social media. People need to follow you on all the different platforms and we'll put all that. We'll put your book in the show notes, everything about you. But it looks like you're about to push out a new course. Tell me about that. Um, so the newest course, which will be coming out uh, maybe today or oh, uh, within, the, within the next few days Great. is actually uh, a uh, course on blood work. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the things that we just talked yeah. about, uh, but in more detail, we'll talk about, you know, what blood work should you be getting, um, you know, what, uh, how to interpret some of that blood work. Um, I also have another I have a uh, course which was released um, uh, within the past few weeks on fasting, and it goes into some of the, uh, you know, basics of fasting, as well as uh, some of the uh, nuanced topics of fasting. And uh, we're adding, um, we're continuing to add uh, courses uh, to my website. Uh, We're trying to get, you know, a couple of courses out a month. Uh, So that's one of the main ways that I'm looking to work with people. You know, obviously, um, I can't work with everyone one on one. Um, and so, uh, I continue to look for ways that I can get this information to the people that need to have it. And so the book, uh, the courses, um, I'm going to be rolling out a group coaching program, um, soon as well. Uh, and then I have my, you know, telemedicine based practice, which is available to patients across the United States uh, for me to work with people one on one. Well, as I said, the just the title of the book, Stay Off My Operating Table, is so catchy because, again, I mean, <laughs> Western medicine does not look at things that way. They say, come on, get on my operating table. Come on, let's have another surgery. Let's, you know, let's rip out that gallbladder, though. You know, woman after woman that I talked to says, you know what? I didn't feel any better after that. Or I didn't feel better after my hysterectomy. So I, it's just a different paradigm from what I'm talking to women who are desperate, who've gained weight. They can't lose it. They don't know what to do. And a lot of times they're not dealing with all their parts. So now hard as a part, obviously you get to keep. And if you don't, you know what happens. So um, I just think that's a great way to put that. One more thing, just because we were talking about the Europeans and um, you know, you go to France, it's the best butter you've ever had, you know, England, my gosh, the cream, <laughs> you've never had anything like it, but those people smoke like it's their job. What's their heart disease like in Europe? Well, it's, um, getting worse. Um, okay, and you know, smoking. again, yeah, well, the smoking is part of it. And then the, you know, corruption of their food supply, just like ours have, you know, oh. more and more, they're getting away from that great heavy cream and the real butter. Oh, and, shoot. you know, this concept that they should be eating, you know, vegetable and seed oils instead of it uh, is uh, infiltrating um, there as well. So, you know, their their heart uh, disease continues to get worse. Um, but, you know, we still have that so-called French paradox. And, you know, it's a, it, it just ironic that here we are 50 years later still calling it the French paradox um, when, you know, it, it's not it, the, the French aren't the problem with the diet heart hypothesis. The diet heart hypothesis is the problem. And, and the French, as well as many other examples, you know, really disprove that hypothesis, but the the promoters of the hypothesis don't want to admit that. So they label it as an anomaly and a paradox. But it's clear that it was never the saturated fat that was causing the problem. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, eating the real butter like they do. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because um, their carbohydrate intake ends up being, you know, a little bit h- higher yeah. Uh, then, you know, a lot of the low carb community thinks is healthy. And yet we don't see the same problems occurring, um, you know, probably because the types of carbohydrates that they are consuming, um, they're not, you know, at least traditionally weren't heavily processed. Um, you know, uh, the grains were more traditional. Yeah. And so, you know, you can tolerate them better. Um, but uh, as you as you process the food more, as it gets more and more refined and the nutrients get stripped out of it, you know, that's when we start to see the problems. 
So, uh, Dr. Ovedia, let's wrap this up. What's on the menu for you tonight for your one meal? Or if you've already had one, like, what do you plan for dinner? Steak and butter? Um, Yeah, it's going to be probably either steak or ground beef of some sort. Um, You know, again, I don't plan it much in advance. I usually go to the fridge or or the freezer and grab something out of there and throw it in a pan. And a few minutes later, I'm eating. So that's the simplicity of the uh, carnivore life. That's exactly right. Well... Good luck to you. Yeah, great job with the message. And let's just keep educating people that you've been lied to. I'm sorry to yell, but it's my podcast, so I can yell. So. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.